Thank you, Dr. Sabal. Um, Your Excellencies, Mr. Ireland, HMA delegates, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you again for this opportunity to, to share our story at HMA uh, in your beautiful country. Uh, I'm in a room full of healthcare giants and it's extremely humbling. So thank you for the platform. Our story today is one of a small rural community hospital um, that refused to accept its inevitable fate um, of closure and instead chose to innovate. So today I'll speak on Telerounding, an application of virtual care. It was the first in Canada model used in a small rural Canadian hospital. Quick disclosure, myself, uh, I work for my health authority as an employee. Uh, my health authority, Health PEI, does have a software licensing agreement with the vendor Maple that I'll speak to today. Uh, our organization also has a research agreement in place for an academic research study around telerounding, and I myself have no personal contractual or paid affiliation with Maple, the telehealth vendor that I'll reference. My organization, uh, at a glance, and just to give you a little overview, so I'm from the eastern part of Canada in a province called Prince Edward Island. Um, similar, it's, it's about 2,100 square miles uh, geographically, uh, about 155,000 residents, so a very small province. Um, health PEI is a one island health authority uh, governing the entire province. Um, organization, at a glance, about 4,200 employees, 230 physicians, um, six hospitals that span. So again, to reference that, you could drive from one end of the island to the other in about six hours. So we have six hospitals scattered across and a number of community health sites. So quick background. So Western Hospital is located in a small community called Alberton, residents of about 4,000, um, predominantly a fishing and farming community, and that's where Western Hospital is located. It's a 27-bed rural community care facility serving a catchment area of about 15,000 uh, residents. Traditionally, patients were cared for by their family physician who also provided care to unaffiliated patients on a rotational basis. Um, any gaps in coverage were supplemented by either inter or provincial locum support. So our problem, we have a regional complement of 10 physicians and over the last 10 years it's been chronically a challenge to fill some of the physician vacancies. A very common story right across the globe so at this point, we had two to three physician vacancies in any given moment. We had two physicians that identified their impending retirements in 2016 and 2017. And then over the years, we've had a few physicians that work in the area without any hospital privileges. So that left us with two physicians that were um, agreeing to provide some sort of inpatient support for all 27 inpatients. So we had a transitioning complement, locum burnout, physician burnout, a lot of dissatisfaction and we saw our impending fate as early in 2017 into 2018 that, um, that we were up against a really significant challenge. So we had an unsustainable inpatient care model and we had to do something different. Very tight timelines to be able to do this as well. So our aim, uh, as we look to try and solve this problem, threefold, one, we needed to stabilize inpatient care services somehow. Um, we've done our jurisdictional scans, it's been a challenge right across our country and outside to try and find that, that secret sauce. Um, we knew that we were looking at some sort of integration of technology. Um, so we were looking at a high adoption and integration rate as well as whichever model we put in, it needed to provide a safe, effective level of quality care without compromising the patient experience. We had a lot of challenges in front of us, a lot of hurdles to overcome. Uh, first and foremost, we were in a community where multiple generations of family were cared by the same physician. So we were looking at really disrupting um, that way of delivering care and, and placing a TV screen. So we have some big challenges ahead of us, looking at the legislative, regulatory, legal challenges to consider this new application, this new model in our country. Uh, we had physician reimbursement considerations, capital investments, no reference model in our country to build from. So we were, we were throwing away the box and really trying to, to innovate. Um, we had a new technology design. We had to completely redesign our hospital workflow um, and then we were fortunate enough in our province to have a province-wide electronic medical record. So we were looking to capitalize on that as well and simultaneously pilot VPN access for 10 different physicians across our country into our health record to make this pilot work. We also unfortunately had to do this amongst a significant nursing crisis in the middle of summer and we had less than 90 days to do it. Because on day 91 there were no physicians left that would agree to provide care in our hospital. So enablers for our success. Um, our province became really good at innovating by crisis. 
So consequence by failure really served as a driving force. Our government had a strong commitment to all its facilities and its hospitals, but we're tired of dealing with the problem and wanted a solution first and foremost. So we had a tremendous amount of government support to look at a creative option to do this. We also had a number of physician champions that evolved from our local physicians working in our emergency departments that would have to, to be our hands on the ground to support any acute needs to eventually some local physicians that once this model was up and running, put their hand up and said, I'll, I'll give it a try, and then gave their endorsement. Transparent communication with all our stakeholders, with our regulatory partners, with our medical societies, with our community groups, um, was something that we've prided ourselves in doing quite well, and it was a big proponent as looking in terms of how we shift delivery care to ensure that not only did the communities um, and organizations understand what our challenges were, but to give an opportunity to partner in the solution. And then staff investment in the project was a significant driving force, but for the first time in the history of our hospital and the community, we had a chance to participate and rewrite our own history. That was exceptionally inspiring for our staff to come together in such a short period of time for the heavy lifting that was required. That being said, they also knew if they could prove the concept for their own hospital, potentially it could lend itself then to a new support system for our country, because closures and reductions of services for our rural hospitals was a very consistent um, message and reality that our country's been facing with. So the provider, Maple, um, I've referenced them a few times and I will as well, there is no telerounding without this really innovative company. So they're a Canadian-based new virtual care company in our country that we're connecting patients to licensed physicians right across the entire country at the point of consumer. So they had a really great business and we approached them in terms of coming into the public system. So our hospitals right across the province and right across the country, it's an entire public system as well. So we were partnering with a private vendor to come in and into a public system and see if we can make their technology um, applicable for our environment. So telerounding in itself. So on the screen is a picture of Bev Ashley. She's the clinical lead for our hospital with one of our um, telemedicine carts that we use. So essentially in this case, telerounding, we're using a telemedicine platform to facilitate inpatient care coverage, leveraging physician capacity outside of our province across the country. Um, that's really the, the basis of what we were hoping to do when we're able to achieve. Um, we had functionality to be able to upload our files, um, utilizing peripheral Bluetooth devices like stethoscopes um, in terms of where we want to continue to evolve how we deliver care. And again, we had a great opportunity to utilize our electronic medical record and then connect these physicians in into our environment so that they can see the patient's chart and they're charting digitally running our care plans, be able to manage our orders and um, keep the patient's chart up to date. So a quick update in terms of how the process works. So essentially we went live on August 7th, 2018. We've been running for about 14 months. Um, 7.30 in the morning is when shift change is their 12 hour shifts for registered nurses. They would facilitate bedside rounding. At that time, at 9 a.m., um, like clockwork, our telerounding physician could be located anywhere across the Canada, would VPN into electronic medical record. We would predefine which patients they would need to see that day they would be able to uh, familiarize themselves with the patient's chart. 15 minutes later, we would do a team huddle between the physician and our staff in a, in a huddle room that we would have already pre, uh, predefined. They would take 15 minutes, make sure that they have the plan for the morning, and then at 9.30, the process would begin. So our clinical lead or team lead nurse would wheel the telemedicine cart into the first patient room. They would set it up at the bedside. They would initiate the consult. The physician would come up on the screen and it was just like any other interaction with our physicians. And that's what our patients told us, and that's what we saw. It was quite incredible. So the interaction would take place, our physicians would be able to um, update our progress notes and information in electronic medical record. They would do their orders, consults, referrals, prescriptions. It was all done remotely. The hospital platform itself, um, that Maple had designed for this, which again, the process had to come together very quickly. Seven days before go live was the first time we saw a screenshot of what the actual platform would look like. This was a complete new build to meet our privacy requirements. So three days before go live is when we did training with our staff that we saw the application of how this new technology would actually be used in the hospital itself. So it's terrific that we have our own EMR. The platform itself has its own built-in EMR if you wouldn't have one as well. What's really interesting 
how this model works, we have a physician capacity for four hours every morning from 9 until 1 p.m. At that point, the responsibility defaults back to our emergency physician. That's how the model always operated, whether we had an in-person physician or virtual physician. What we saw the benefits was this back-end messaging. So the company created an encrypted pathway that if there was a question about potassium level in the afternoon, instead of having to take that to one of our local physicians in the emergency room, we could send a quick text through an app, through this platform, which would then go to the other physician, wherever they would be, and again, likely they're probably working. Because again, we're taking advantage of their capacity, so they might have the morning off uh, and the time difference. They may be doing an emergency shift somewhere. In this case, then they would be able to, it would ping on their phone, they would be able to give a quick response, maybe some direction. Maybe they'll say, I'll get back to you in 30 minutes, or you have to go check with your emergency physician. So it really extended our reach and gave that comfort level to our staff that it wasn't, again, putting that additional dependence on our existing providers. So the patient experience itself was amazing. So here's an example, Julie uh, Goody, who spent 11 days in the hospital with us. Uh, she noted she thought it made a lot of sense, especially being out of the country with the shortage of doctors here on the island. I thought it was an excellent experience. They were here right in front of you on the TV screen. I could see them. They could see me. I had, they had all my charts from 20 years ago. They knew my medications. It was just top notch. And that's what we saw. One of the over 14 months, we've done about 4,000 teleconsults through this model with about 350 patients. And the feedback has been quite amazing. So about 50% of our patients said that it was equal to the experience they had with an in-person provider. But what's really interesting to us is that a third of our patients said it was a better experience. And one of the reasons they would say that is because they had the undivided attention of the physicians directly in front of you. No, no distractions, no interruptions. That direct interaction was there until the consult was completed. In terms of successes, as I mentioned, one of the goals was the stability for inpatient care services. We were able to achieve that. We brought a level of stability. It's pretty difficult to recruit new providers into an environment when you have instability. So we were able to do that. We had a great adoption from our patients, our community, from our providers. Most of our physicians now are actually within the province. So we started with out of province physicians, leveraging their capacity, and eventually we had enough adoption from our own physicians in our province that said, hey, you know what? I don't want to drive three hours to do this, but I can provide it remotely from my home. And that works out quite well. Uh, we were able to provide reprieve. As I mentioned, we had two physicians in the area remaining that were just burnt out. And they were a husband and wife. They never took a day off. And for the first time in two years, when we put this model in place, they were able to give up their patients on weekends where they felt comfortable and confident that they could recharge. And they just had this renewed joy to practice again. Um, in summary, you know, this pilot, this program was born out of necessity to prevent um, a services continuation for the patients and the community. Um, we think this is an example that demonstrates how innovation and appropriate change management can lead to solutions in a very complex environment like a healthcare system. And then our early indications using telerounding have been quite positive and certainly the potential to scale up across the country to service other uh, remote and medically underserviced communities we believe is a low hanging fruit in Canada and outside of our country as well. Thank you.